share a little bit. I want you to turn to the book of Jude. Jude has 25 verses, 25 verses in, in the book of Jude. And I talk about tonight we'll be talking about Jude's ur- uh, urgent warning, Jude's urgent warning. And he does have an urgent warning here. So in Jude, if you'd like to turn that, you don't have to stand up tonight. I'm just going to do an expository type of teaching, an exegetical, exegetical expository Um, inductive or deductive, excuse me, deductive kind of teaching here tonight, all right? Praise God. The Word of God is good. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and to worship you, Father. We are to be instant in season and out of season, and I pray that you'd be honored and glorified. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to be able to minister thy Word. I pray that our hearts would be open to receive of the truth, God. Uh, Father, I'm glad that we're able to have our doors open on a Sunday night. We want our doors open. I thank you for the presence of the Lord, and I thank you for what we do have in this church and in this ministry. It does not cost come without a price. It doesn't come without seeking your face, without praying. And so, God, I pray tonight that you'd help me just to deliver the message, the Word of God, according to thy will. I pray that you'd put your thoughts inside of my head and in my heart, that I might minister what you desire, Father. So I thank you, Lord. We praise you. We ask this tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Jude here in chapter 1. Well, actually, there's only one chapter of Jude starting with the first verse in Jude. And notice it says Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And so if he was a brother of James, that means uh, that Jude was also a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. Uh, that is Jude. Amen. He's the half-brother of uh, Jesus, and he's also the brother of James. It says James, a, a Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That means that he humbles himself to the Lord. That means that God's in charge. He subjects himself to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ and brother of James. Amen. You know, I, when you live with somebody, you know everything about them. You know the goods, the bad. You know everything. You live with them. You know them. Well, here they see that Jesus, there was something different about him. There was something special about him. They also believed that he was God, that he was the Son of God, and also had to come to the saving knowledge of God the same way that you and I come to the saving knowledge of God. They had to repent of their sins, acknowledge that they're a sinner, and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. To those who are called. The word called, I love that, means that God has called out to you and I. Now, I I don't want to mess up your theology, but I want you to realize that that, uh, you didn't call on God, but He called on you first. Amen. Amen. It's not that you found God, but He found you. There's nothing in us that would desire God, nothing whatsoever, that God called out to you and thank God that He did. Wherever you are, how old you were, I don't know. Maybe in a revival service, maybe at home watching on television, an evangelist or something. I don't know. Sunday school teacher whatever it might be, but God was dealing with your heart. That's the call of God. God's reaching out to you. God is dealing with your heart, and you came under conviction, under the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God, and therefore you responded to God, and you said yes to the Lord. In an affirmative way, you said yes to God. So God, you are called. God has called us. We are the church of the living God. We are the ecclesia. God has called us out of sin. He's called us out of bondage. He's called us out of darkness to, to live in the light of God's Son, to live for the Lord. You're not your own. The Bible said we are bought at a price. We belong to God. We don't even belong to ourselves, but we are called out of darkness and now we live our lives for God. It said also that we are sanctified. That means that there, the sanctification sanctified means a cut has been made. Amen. A cut is made. So now we live our lives. We are separate now and we live our lives for God. We are separate from sin. Amen. We are separate from the world. Amen. I didn't say that we we're better than anybody else, but we we are called out of the world, called out of sin, separated to live our lives for God, sanctified by God, which means God does the sanctifying, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. And he said in verse 2, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, which is a greeting of Jude to the saints of God. Then verse 3 says, beloved, while I was very diligent, there was an urgency about this, very diligent to write to you concerning concerning our common salvation. He wants to talk about Jesus. He wants to talk about the salvation and what God has done for us. How Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for us and gave his life for us. He wants to talk about the saving grace of God. But then all of a sudden you can see that the Holy Spirit seems to grip his heart and be, bring him a different direction. He said, but love it while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Then he stops there, comma, he says, 
but I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. There is a reason the Holy Spirit had changed thy direction here or the flow here in Jude. There's a reason, there's an urgency that Jude said that we need to contend for the faith. I want to ask the church, he said, I want to call out to Christians and saints of God, those that are bond servants, those that are separate, those that are sanctified, those that belong to the Lord, to contend for the faith, contend for the faith. And so what does it mean to contend for the faith? Well, the term the faith refers to the gospel proclaimed by Christ and the apostles. Now, understand that it is the fixed and unaltered truth given by the Holy Spirit and embodied in the New Testament. The word contend here, if you can kind of grasp this, grasp this tonight, describes the battle that the faithful believer must fight in the defense of the faith. So just the fact that uses the word contend tells us that there is going to be a warfare. There is going to be a battle. Can I tell you here tonight that the devil wants to shipwreck our faith? You see, if the devil can shipwreck our faith, then he can keep us from receiving anything that God has for you and I. Everything that we get or gain from God always has to come through the channel of faith through Jesus Christ. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in other things, but faith in Christ. Amen. Faith in God. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. You want healing. We've got to come to Him by faith. You want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We have to come to Him by faith. You want the gifts and operation of the Spirit to work and flow through your life and in your ministry, in your church, then we have to come to God by faith. God always works and God always moves in the realm of faith. In the realm of faith. The only way that Peter was able to walk on water was because he had faith in the Word of God. Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter was the one that got outside the boat and he walked on water. But it wasn't until he got his eyes off of Jesus that he began to sink. And that's what happens to you you and I, when we get our eyes off of Jesus, we'll sink every time. But there is a fight, folks. I want to know you to know that tonight. There is a contention. There is a warfare. And we need to contend for the faith. Contend literally means to struggle. Do I have a witness tonight? Sometimes it's just a struggle to get up. Sometimes it is a struggle to praise, isn't it? Come on, somebody. Talk to me tonight. It is a struggle at times to even come to the house of God. It's a struggle sometimes. Sometimes to pray, it's a struggle to worship, but nevertheless, you must press through anyway. Don't listen. Don't listen to that, that, that false voice out there that says that God doesn't care. God does care. God does see. God does know. And God desires for us to press in regardless. Uh, the word contend means to struggle or it means to suffer or to be under great stress uh, or to fight a fight. Therefore, we must, listen to this, exert ourselves. The word exert means to put everything you have into it. Exert ourselves, put everything you have into it, to the utmost in the defense of God's Word and the New Testament faith. Even though it may be costly at times, we must give it everything we have, like Paul said, to fight the good fight of faith. Why did Paul say that? Fight the good fight of faith because he knows that the devil is going to try to do everything he has to cause you to doubt God, to cause you to doubt God. The reason the children of Israel in the Old Testament did not uh, uh, obtain the promised land that God had for them, and they had to wander in that wilderness for 40 years, the reason was because they didn't have the faith to believe God. Because of their unbelief, because they did not believe the report of God, because they did not believe the word of the Lord. Here God had done miracles after miracles after miracles for nearly a year, and Egypt, God had delivered them. God had parted the Red Sea. God 
God had brought water out of a rock. God had provided. But when it came time for them to cross that Jordan River and to go into that promised land, they didn't look at the greatness of God. They looked at how big the giants were. They looked at their circumstances. They looked at the walls of the city. They looked at all the giants and they said, man, they're fortified and they got giants and they're big. They're big people. There's no way that we can do this. They were looking at how big they were, but they weren't looking at the greatness of God. Folks, listen, we do the same thing. Your pastor does the same thing. But God wants us to look at his greatness. He's still God. The God of the Old Testament, the part of the Red Sea, the God of the New Testament, the delivered and set free and cast demons out and raised the dead is the same God today. He's the same God that shut the mouth of the lions and the lion's den. He's the same God that kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from being burned up in the fiery furnace. And when they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. He's the same God that provided for Elijah. Brother Book Cherith. He's the same God today. God changes not. His word doesn't change. Amen. So God wants us to have a faith to believe him. And anything you're going to receive of God must come in the channel of faith. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to all the spiritual blessings that we have from God. But he tells us here, I know, even though it may be costly at times, we must give it everything we have. Like Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Now, I believe that as we live this Christian life according to the Word of God, to the best of our ability, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we are contending for the faith. By not giving into sin, we are contending for the faith. By not compromising into the world's ways or standards, we are contending for the faith. By not bowing down to the devil, we are contending for the faith. I believe that as we experience spiritual warfare and spiritual battles, that we are contending for the faith. When we refuse to give up, we are contending. When we refuse to give in to the devil, we are contending. When we refuse to compromise, we are contending. When we are on our knees praying, we are contending for the faith. I think of all those through the hundreds of years that would not give up the fight. I think of Christians and missionaries and preachers and evangelists and many of them lost their lives for the cause of the gospel of Christ. They never buckled. They never gave up. They never gave in. They never compromised. They contended for the faith. They contended for the faith. I I read this the other night. If you can turn with me, please, to the book of Hebrews and the great chapter of faith, of course, the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And just look at verse 33, and let me read this tonight because I think it is so powerful. Verse 33 of chapter 11 in Hebrews, who through faith, notice this, it is through faith, subdued kingdoms and worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions and quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. These all these are people that suffered warfare. These are people that, that were contending for the faith and they never gave up and they never threw in the towel. They never ran from God but they ran to God. Verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. These are people that were thought it was a glory to suffer for God. They, they counted it an honor to suffer for the Lord. You, you read some of the writings of Paul and it was an honor to suffer for God. It was an honor to be able to be persecuted for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. They knew they were doing something right. If they were thrown in prison if they were beaten, if they were mocked, whatever it might be, they knew they were doing something right for the kingdom of God. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, of chains of imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves on the earth. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not not receive the promise. All these people never gave up. They never gave up. Even in this lifetime, they didn't see what they were hoping to see until they made it into the very presence of God in heaven. But still, they held on. Whether they saw it or not, they held on. Whether God delivered them or not, they still had faith. They still believed God. They held on to God no matter what. These are people that contended for the faith. And I think that's the kind of faith that we're going to need today if we're going to make it, church. Because I know this one thing. The devil is fighting against good, godly people like yourselves and against good 
good, godly, solid teaching, doctrinal churches of today. The devil is fighting very, very hard. So James, or excuse me, Jude would tell us to contend for the faith. Look at here. Look with me here. He says, why would we need to contend for the faith and concern, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints? The faith of God, the, the, the word of God, the teachings of the word of God that was delivered to you. You need to contend for the faith. Now, there's a reason for this. Now, here we go. He says in verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. Now, look at this. People have come into the churches. People have come into the congregations in the body of Christ. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. People didn't realize. Maybe they, they, they said they're a Christian. Maybe they can sing all the right songs and say all the right words. And maybe they had a great personality. And they had wonderful charisma and things like this. Maybe they were talented in different things. But he said they've crept in unnoticed who, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. But what kind of men have crept into the church? He said ungodly men. Ungodly men. Men that portray to be of God, men that maybe say the right words, maybe men that have charisma and, and have good personalities and so forth, maybe even good looks and million dollar suits, I don't know, but he says these people, these are ungodly men, and now what do they do? What are these men doing? Well look at this, and this is the time we're living in today, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about this, they're not going to openly just deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but I'm telling what they're going to do. They're going to try to change what the Word of God says. They're going to twist it and they're going to change it ever so slightly to conform to their teaching, to conform to their lifestyle. And we're living in a time today when people have taken this word grace and they're not using it in its proper context. And so because of the grace of God, I don't have to pray. Or because of the grace of God, I don't have to be faithful to the Lord. Or because of the grace of God, I don't have to go to the house of worship if I don't want to. Well, I don't see that in the Bible. Because of the grace of God, I can live however I want to live and God will still accept me into heaven. Because of the grace of God, I can be homosexual or gay and God's okay with it and God loves me and God will accept me into heaven that's what's being taught that's what's being said today we've let the standard of god down we've let the standard of the word of god down we've we've slowly twisted god's word and we've taken words out of context we're not preaching them in the context of the word of god grace does not give us the license to sin Grace doesn't say it's okay to live this kind of sinful lifestyle and god's going to be okay with it that's not the grace of god that's not the grace of God. Praise God that we do have His grace. If it wasn't for His grace, we wouldn't be saved. If it wasn't for His grace, our sins would not be forgiven. If it wasn't for His grace, we would not make it into heaven. That's only by the grace of God. It is the grace of God that we can come tonight and worship the Lord. It's the grace of God we can pray. It's the grace of God that we can serve the Lord. It's the grace of God that we can worship Him. That's the grace of God, my friend. But I'm so tired. Of hearing churches today saying that you can live a promiscuous lifestyle and God's okay with it. I'm tired of hearing people and Christians twist and tort the Word of God. They contort the Word of God to what they want to hear to their lifestyle. And rather than subjecting our lives to the Word of God, they're trying to change the Word of God and subject God's Word to their lifestyle. And James said these people are going to come into your church and they're going to come unnoticed. They're going to sound, they're going to, they know the Christian lingo. They're going to say the right words, but it's not going to be right. I think what we have today is the spirit like what Paul had to deal with with Saul, uh, with, excuse me, with, with uh, Paul and Silas when there was a girl that was demon possessed. And there was, she was saying all the right words for days. She's behind them and saying, these are men of the most high God. Listen to them and show us the way of salvation. All the words that she said were right. But Paul, in his spirit, was vexed. It was vexed. And finally, when he got the green light, finally, when God showed him and revealed to him what it was, he turned around and he cast that demon. It was a demon spirit that said the right words, but it was of the wrong spirit. It was an evil spirit. It was a wicked spirit. It was a demon, demonic witchcraft spirit and by the name of jesus christ paul cast that demon out of that girl and set her free and you can have people that seem right can say all the right words but in my spirit it is vexed and that's what we're dealing with here and the same thing he's trying to warn the church he's trying to warn people like you and i 
People, listen to this, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that these people are not going to go walking around in the church denying God. They're not going to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they're going to pray in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, pastor, then how are they going to deny the Lord? By twisting his word. By taking his word and twisting it and making it something else. And I've had people through the many years, some come and go, have done that in this church. They don't last too long. I mark them out pretty quickly knowing that something's just not right. They don't know, but I have my eye on them. And I've had some that have done damage to this church through the past years. Sometimes it takes a while to recover. Some people believe the lie as if it's true. And Jude is saying way back nearly 2,000 years ago that we have to be careful because this is going to happen. They're going to sneak in and they're going to be coming unaware and you're going to think they're okay when something is just not quite right. He said in verse 5, but I want to remind you, though, you once knew this. You, you knew this, and he wants to remind us. So repeating a message is a good thing, and saying it over and over is a good thing, because sometimes we forget, we need to be reminded, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, remember that in the Old Testament? God delivered the people out of Egypt, out of bondage, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. They were destroyed. They did not believe God had to let them die out. And even those that came and rose up against God, God destroyed them. And there was, God is talking about his judgment. God will deal with it. God will judge those people and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. That one third of the angels were cast out of heaven that followed after Satan, which I happen to believe are demon spirits, by the way. I, I know there's a big controversy on that. But it says that God has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So it tells me that there is going to be judgment for those who have rebelled against God, those who have twisted the word of God, those that have turned the grace of God into lewdness, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes in verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked cities in the Old Testament, cities of homosexuality and so forth. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality. I am not a hateful person. I am not preaching a hate message. But I don't know how anybody can practice that kind of lifestyle as we talked about this morning and somehow take the word of God and say that God is okay with it. When I see in the Old Testament, when I see also in the book of Romans and the New Testament, when I see in the book of, is it the book of Colossians, the book of Ephesians, the book of First Corinthians in chapter 6, when I see it in there, and I also see it here in Jude. I see it here in Jude. God, no, that is wickedness before the Lord. It is sin. And God will judge, and that's what God is saying here, that God is going to judge these things. And he says, in sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. These people are in danger of hellfire. As anybody that is lost without God, anybody that's a sinner and doesn't know God, is also in danger of hellfire. But you can't say that you can live that kind of lifestyle. Now, understand that they're all welcome here in this church. They're welcome here in this church. I will, I will preach the word of God to them. I will preach the truth to them. And I pray that they'll give their heart to the Lord. We want people to be saved. We want them to be delivered out of that darkness because Satan has them blinded. He has their minds blinded. He has their eyes blinded. They're blinded. They're believing this as if it's okay, as if God had created them this way or they were born this way. No, you were not born that way. You were not created that way. That is Satan taking what, what God has made in the image of God and twisting it and contorting it rather than bringing glory to God and bring shame. And I think that we as a body of Christ need to have compassion. And we need to reach out to them. And we need to share the love of God. There's no doubt about that. But I will not stand here. And I'll never tell them that you can still live a sinful lifestyle. And it's okay. And God will accept you into heaven. That is just not true. That is not true. And yet you have churches that are allowing homosexual and gay pastors and, and women and men behind the pulpit being pastors and elders teaching the church when they're in sin themselves. No, my friend. Let it not be so. And I believe this is the very thing that, some, that Jude is talking about and warning the church against. Now, understand that I didn't write this, by the way. I'm just reading it. I'm reading what the Word of God says. I didn't write this. So if you have an issue with it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the Lord, okay? Because he's the one that wrote this, all right? Now, God talks about this, this judgment. God is a God of judgment. 
And he's judging sin right now. Romans tells us that he is judging sin right now, this very moment. And I believe that America is suffering the very judgment of God as a consequence of their sin or actions when it's okay to kill unborn babies. Even though it says it's a law and it's okay to do that. No, my friend, there's a higher law. The law says thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. These are human beings. These are lives in the wombs of women. And they have every right to live. They have every right to live. Likewise, verse 8, also these dreamers defile the flesh. He's talking about these people that are false teachers and have turned the grace of God into lewdness and lasciviousness. He said they're dreamers, defile the flesh, reject authority. They reject authority. Don't you see that today? They're going to do what they want to do, and they're not going to subject themselves because they're full of pride, they're full of sin, they're full of themselves. And they reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. They're going to try to control. They're going to try to manipulate. They're going to try to take over. And I've seen this. Going to try to take over. And sometimes I want to say, wait a minute, you're not the pastor here. Amen. You're not the pastor. I'm going to share something here, and it's kind of probably blow some of you up a little bit here, and that's okay. But I'm not going to mention any names, but I remember one particular meeting we were at, men's meeting. We were in a restaurant, and, uh, and we were just talking in fellowship and having a wonderful time and everything. And, and we, I don't know if we had even ordered our food yet or anything. And someone in that particular meeting who likes to be in control of things, but they're not the pastor, and I didn't ask them to be in control of things, uh, looked over to Brother Don and said, Brother Don, would you pray and open up the meeting for us? And Brother Don did one of the greatest things I've ever, outside of giving a kidney, I thought this was right on. He stopped and he says, well, I don't know. And he looked over to me, he says, Pastor, do you want me to pray? I thought, hallelujah, I was dancing there. I tell you, I was, I was, that's exactly right. Because that person didn't have the right to do what they did. And Brother Don was saying, there's only one pastor in this group, and it's that man over there. And I want to ask him if he wants me to pray or not. Amen. Get up here and preach, little boy. I remember that. And I thought, I don't know, and I'm sure he maybe realized what was going on, but I thought that was quick thinking. That was good. And sometimes, I'm just telling you, they reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. And they'll go in the church and they'll little whisper any little things in your ears and cause you to try to doubt what maybe that church is doing or what they're teaching or what's going on in that ministry. And they'll try to put seeds of doubt there as well. He said in verse 9, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil... Oh, that's right, boy. That's what we're continuing with the devil, right? When he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Look at verse 10. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. Now, now Jude doesn't hold back. He calls it out for what it is. And I believe that what Jude is, is seeing here behind the scenes is the spiritual darkness and the evil. That's instigating this, that's running this behind the scenes like brute beast in these things. They corrupt themselves. Then he says in verse 11, woe to them, woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. This rebellious spirit that have rejected the ways of God have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, have perished in the rebellion of Korah. And there are people that are in this. It's just a job to them. It's not a calling in their lives. They're in it because all they care about is their pocketbook and all they care about is the pocketbook of the people. Listen to him. I'm going to tell you something. I know I've been accused of this before. But, you know, I, I want to say something here that I, I am, I'm not after your pocketbook. I'm after your heart. God is not after your pocketbook. God is after your heart. And if God has your heart, everything will also fall into place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. People that have issues with me when I Ask a receiver, take up the tithe of their offering to the people that don't tithe. I, I've had it. There are people that I don't, not now, not here in the church, but. All pastor cares about is money, they said. Well, if you think all I care about money, then we don't need to be reaching these kids because these kids cost. They don't bring in revenue. It, it costs me over $2,000 a year just to have insurance on these three vehicles. It costs to keep these vehicles running. Brother Don just put $76 of fuel into one of them today. It costs. 
And I know I wish it didn't take money. I wish I didn't have to worry about money. I wish I never had. But I want you to understand that this is God's way, by the way. God is the one that said in the Word about tithes, about offerings, about giving. And Paul was asking for support and the work that he was doing as well. And it does take money, but it also takes sacrifice. In other words, what do we care about the most? For where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? What is it that you emphasize the most? I think of the spiritual things of life, how important it is that we do the work of the ministry and how we reach these children in preaching the gospel of Christ. This is the answer to the entirety of the world. This message that we have, this is the only way that a person can be saved is by repentance of sin and then asking Jesus Christ into their heart as their Lord and their Savior. Now, he says this, run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perish in the rebellion of Korah. Verse 12, these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They're not serving God. They might act like they are, but they've snuck in. They they say they're Christians and they can say all the right words and they carry a Bible under their arm and they get all kinds of scriptures marked out and so forth. But he said, these are spots in your love feast and while they feast with you. They, they hear they have fellowship with you. They're with you. They feast with you. But without fear, serving themselves, not God. In other words, they have their own interest involved in this. It's not about you. It's not about God. It's about what they can get out of you. It's how they can use you. It's how they can abuse you. It's how they can take advantage of you. And we have to be spiritually alert and awake to these things. It's important to know the Word of God. It's important to have discernment today. There was a, a pastor one time who took advantage of this wonderful couple right here. This beautiful couple. And in their heart, they were trying to help a church. A small church. And they took the pastor at face value and thought he was an honest man and a decent man and a godly man. And the church needed money, and they couldn't get a loan. And so they offered to put a loan on their credit card, $10,000. Am I right? Ten grand. Ten grand. They stuck their neck out. They believed in the work. They believed in that pastor. They believed in that ministry. And they gave $10,000 to the church as a loan. And if I got my facts right, you never got a payment. Right. That's what I was saying. That's right. They took the money and they went on trips. The pastor, his wife, and they never, dinner, wine and dine, they never got anything. Ran up to $10,000. So people that are taking advantage of other people. And I think that's what Jude is talking about here. Now, he said, these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the wind. I mean, the clouds, you're, you're thinking, okay, now I know we've had a lot of rain here lately, but if you're in a drought and you see clouds coming, you think, oh, praise God, we're going to get something. Those clouds are going to deliver. But these are like clouds that pass right over you, but they don't give a thing. They just look good on the outside, but they don't give anything of themselves. It's the late autumn trees without fruit. Now, there's a time when fruit, the trees need to bear. But he's saying these are like trees that never bear. They never give anything of themselves. He said they're twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. He talks again that the judgment of God is going to come upon these people. Now, he said in verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, now apparently there's a book of Enoch. It's not here as far as canonized as the word of God. We have 66 books in the Bible, but there are other books out there. There are a lot of books out there, but these are the books that 
we feel that we're inspired to be considered a part or canonized in the word of God. So Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints, hallelujah, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds or their actions or their acts or how they took advantage of people or their motives which they have committed in an ungodly way and all and uh, of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him so whether you like it or not there is going to come a day of reckoning there's going to come a day of judgment but thank god that we're saved thank god that we're under the blood when i see the blood i'll pass over you amen so i know it sounds bad and this is bad and this is a warning and he's trying to warn the church and i'm just skimming the surf of this thing here tonight i'm just sharing a little bit about the word of god with you but i want you to look at this verse 16 these are grumblers complainers walking according to their own lust and they mouth great swelling words. They give great promises to the people, flattering people, flattering their great personalities and great charisma to gain advantage. To take advantage of you. But you, beloved, listen to this. Remember the words which you were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, in the last days. I believe in the days that we're living in right now, who would walk according to their own ungodly lust, living for their pleasure, living for their flesh, living for their sin. These are sensual persons, fleshly people who cause divisions. Now, I just want to say that I'm just reading what the Bible says. Causing divisions and turning people that once trusted in you to turn against you. The word that you preach, the word that's according to the Bible, the word that can help people, they've now taken and turned it against you. And now they're saying that that's not right and there's no hope and that's not of God and there's... Are you kidding me? Do you see it here, church? He warns this is going to happen. People, you have to know those you, that labor among you. You have to know them. And it takes a long time to get to know people. But even though you can be right on and living for God, we have to make sure that we continue to stay right on. We have to continue to serve God. We have to continue to keep our eyes on the Lord. We have to make sure that we're in the truth and we're not changing the truth. And we've got to make sure that someone else doesn't come in and start changing the truth and preaching something that tickles the ears and satisfies the flesh or makes you feel so good about yourself. There's a lot of preaching today that makes you feel good about yourself, but those people are lost without God. Lost without God. Have tens of thousands of people in their churches, but they never talk about repentance. They never talk about sin. And they say you can live in that lifestyle of God loves all people, and I'm not going to preach against that because we have to, we've come into a time of acceptance and tolerance. And so now we've, we've come into acceptance and tolerance. And so now we, we throw the word of God out. We throw out what he says. God says here in the book of Jude, and he says this several times, that there's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a time of judgment. And therefore, there needs to be a warning. We have to tell people. Because that day is coming, and it's coming soon. He said, he said, they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to say what you want to hear. They got false motives. And they have a deceptive spirit. Paul talks about a time when people would come in stealth mode, if you will, and they'd be like they'd be like wolves in sheep's clothing that can sing the songs you sing and sound all Christian and know all the lyrics, but yet there's something wrong in their life and their heart, and they're not living for God, and they have something to hide. And so then when you preach the word of God and you hit on that, then they're going to turn against you and say that your message is condemnation. Folks, you want a preacher that preaches the truth. You want to be preached in their conviction. You want the word of God. I'd rather God deal with me now. It may not be comfortable. I remember times, Brother Clendenin, I feel like he killed me many times. And many times leaving out of his conferences down in Beaumont, Texas, I felt like I wasn't even saved. God dealing with things I didn't even know were issues in my life. Now, you, he says, beloved, remember the words which were spoken by 
the, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time that would walk according to their own godly lust. These are central persons who cause division not having the Spirit. They're not of God. I'm not going to say if a person is saved or not. I'm not. But I've known some that are not of God. Not of God. They don't have His Spirit. They have a Spirit. They have a Spirit. But they don't have His Spirit. There is an agreement with my brothers and my sisters in Christ. I can go on the other side of the world and have a language barrier. But if they're saved, there's this agreement. I know that they're part of the kingdom of God. We're part of the family of God. He says, but you, he says, but you, now they're going to cause division in the church. Now he says, but you beloved. Now he says, now he says, this is what we need to do. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. We need to be a people that continually seek the face of God, a people that continually pray. And he says, pray in the spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost. And, and I, I think it's so incredibly important that we be baptized in the Holy Ghost because there are times when I don't even know what to pray or how to pray. And I just yield myself to the Lord. And God began, I began to pray in the Spirit and praying in the Holy Ghost and praying in tongues and so forth. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He said in verse 22, and some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. It means there's a people that are filled with the love of God, but they do hate sin. And they love people so much that they're going to tell them the truth because they know that sin will keep them out of heaven. My friend, that's mercy. That's love. That's grace. Hallelujah. And he says in verse 24, Now to him who is able, can you say able? Able to keep you from stumbling. God is able. He has the power to keep us from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And the church said, Amen. What a warning in the Word of God. What a warning. And I would pray that we would be a people of prayer, that we'd be a people to keep our eyes on the Lord. We'd be a people that have a discerning spirit. And don't go walking around, you know, <laughs> you know, thinking everybody's false. Don't go do that. You'll you'll know. You'll know. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. The, this is an urgent warning that was given by Jude here. And folks, I, I want to tell you that, and I've tried to warn you, and I'm trying to tell you that we are living in the last days. I, 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 I come up here tonight with, a, with an agonizing heart. We are living in the last days. I... Time, these days and times that we're living, sin is at, at a fast pace. It's, everything's come out of the closet. Not just there was a time when they were hiding the sin, but now it's come out of the closet. Now they're they're very they're very proud of it, and it's in your face, and you have to accept it, or else that's considered hate. That's not hate, my friend. I love God, and I will not tolerate, will not accept the sin. Sin is wrong. Sin is wrong. I thank God that he saved us because we're all sinners. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need salvation. We all need forgiveness of our sins. And I'm thankful that we can go to the Lord. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to be careful because the enemy will try to cause us to doubt God, to cause us to doubt God's word, to cause us to get our eyes on something else rather than what's of God or what's of the Lord. And he says they're going to come in and they're going to come in unnoticed. So I think it's so important to have discerning spirit today. I think it's so important that we be filled with the Holy Ghost, that we be filled with God, because there are going to be people that try to take advantage of you. There are going to be people that are, have false motives, and they're living for themselves, and they're selfish gain in their flesh, and they're not living for God. And I think we have to be so very careful that we be humble before God, and we be a people of prayer, we be a people of His Word, we be faithful to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That's all I got tonight. <laughs> Let's stand together, please. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you tonight. God, we worship you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you mind?
if we come up here together tonight to pray for each other. Is that okay? Can we just come on up here in the front tonight and let's pray for each other in the Lord. Just come stand up here if you would. I just feel a little closer to the body of Christ when we do. And we just pray and seek the face of the Lord together.